welcome to the latest episode of the Informing Choices Minipod. There are a number of different approaches, models and frameworks to help us explore the future or potential futures, from driver mapping to horizon scanning to scenario development and design fiction, to mention just a few. Today, we're going to focus on design fiction, which can be defined as a creative approach that speculates about possible futures through the design and portrayal of products, services or scenarios. It blends storytelling and futurism with design thinking to explore the implications of emerging technologies and social trends, for example. So how exactly can design fiction help us consider the future? To help address this question, I'm delighted to welcome back friend of the podcast, strategic communicator and futurist, Gina Clifford. Gina, um, welcome back. We've been talking about discussing this issue for a while, haven't we? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Always a pleasure to join you on the Informing Choices podcast. And this is a topic that I love to talk about and love to think about and appreciate the opportunity to discuss it with you today on the podcast. Brilliant. So, so let's get in. I've, I've kind of outlaid a very brief uh, description of design thinking. How do you define it? How do you, do you describe design thinking? So I always take a nod to the founders of design thinking, and that goes back to, at least according to the Manual of Design Fiction, wrote, written by Julian Bleeker and others. And uh, in that book, they describe how this topic of design fiction came to be. And it actually came to be um, from science fiction writer, Bruce Sterling. So in 2005, Bruce wrote a, I think it was a 150 page book. It, it's a very short book. Maybe it's a short story, but it's nonfiction. And it's called Shaping Things. And in it, he talks about himself writing design fiction and how he described it was, it's like, to a layperson, it, it might be indecipherable indes from science fiction. But how he thinks about it is that science fiction goes into fantastical worlds and it, it makes us think deeply, but it, it, it could go in places that maybe we don't see as being very probable or possible, even though they're interesting and we want to believe in it. But he looks at it as design fiction is more of these are things that are closer to our day to day. So a story, it's more of a scenario than a deep story. And a lot of times the things that are in our world today are in these stories, but there's an element of, what does he call it? Uh, not uncertainty. It just feels like something's off. And then you realize that's because it hasn't happened yet. It feels eerily familiar, but there's something unsettling there. And that's because it's, a, it's being used in a way that isn't familiar to us. And it could be a story, it could be a film, it could be a video, it could be a photo, it could be graphical image, it could be a physical prototype. I guess it isn't bounded by format. It's just easy, easily accessible. It can be done by non-design professionals. It's literally there to help you think differently about a, a near-term future. So that's how I like to describe it. It, some of the thing, some of the things that you you've made me think about in in that description, I, I suppose you would also apply to scenarios. So, um, first of all, I, I I was thinking that we need to connect people between the future that we might be describing and where we are now, because otherwise we risk kind of disconnecting people from from those two points. And actually, that really damages the value that that foresight generally can can bring. I think to organisations. And the other thing that I think you were describing there is how you make design fiction um, compelling, challenging, but plausible. <laughs> I think you have to be a thinker, at least enough to know what's out there right now. So, I mean, I don't say do you just go into it blindly and make something up and call it design fiction. Yeah, I think design fiction is definitely rooted in discipline. So due diligence, research, what are the technologies that are emerging right now? Uh, and, and, and I'll go back to Bruce Sterling's 2005 book, actually in that book, Making Things, he set out two things in the first part of the book. And this is how I, I look at it as well. 
One, he said, there's all these new manufacturing technologies. And I think he was pointing to at the time, like 3D printing and maybe uh, 4D printing, which is something else. And the fact that it hasn't been, it hasn't been processed. Uh, it hasn't put into a discernible process yet at that time. Mm -hmm. So it was new, it was emerging, anything was possible. And he was thinking, well, because it hasn't been grabbed and putting into put into a, an industrial process, there were still opportunities to do crazy in interesting things with it. So keeping that in mind when you're thinking about design fiction, look about those technologies that are similar in that way like right now. And then the other thing he said was manufacturing, the current traditional manufacturing technologies are very uh, extractive to the environment. And so he was very much looking at how this these new technologies could, could take care of that, create new opportunities in the world without extracting from the world to our to all of our detriment. So he thinks of design fiction as how can you create those things around you, right? So anything that's in your surroundings, the tools that you use, Facebook, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, those might all show up in a, in a story that Bruce would write, but then he would create some kind of future application that takes your mind completely in a different direction of how these things come together. So they're, they're there, they're in the environment, but it's unsettling in the way that they're being applied or the outcomes of some of these things. And it really makes you think. And I think anybody who's focused in their world, whatever your discipline is, what are those things around you that are familiar? And then how can you think about future possible outcomes that, um, that these things are part of that aren't necessarily things that people are thinking about right now. And that takes a little bit of creative thinking and I don't think it just pops out, right? It's, it's a, you do a lot of research, you do a lot of thinking and you make kind of these, um, these inferences. And one more thing that Bruce has written, because I am a, a fan of some of this stuff. In 2013, he contributed a short story to the Institute for the Futures uh, book. It was called, it was an anthology. And it was called The Aura of Familiarity. And I believe it's open uh, license so that anybody could Google it and download it. It's, it's a Creative Commons. And he uses a lot of, <clears throat> so it's 2013. So some of the brands and the uh, tools are probably still around, but it sounds a little bit dated, but it's a fantastic short story. And it just, if you read that short story, you can understand how he pulls the familiar and then takes it into a new direction that makes you ponder the future. Um, so I, it's, a, it's a great example. And that's a written example. So I, really, I, I don't know, did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it does. Because, it, you know, I'm, each time you you kind of um, talk a little bit more about what it means to you and 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 how you sort of connect with it, um, I'm, I'm thinking of the kind of the challenge aspect um, of this kind of work, perhaps the more disruptive aspect to, you know, really challenge our minds about what's possible because, and, I, and I, the reason that I always think that's really important is because within a lot of organisations, it's so easy to be grounded in the here and now um, and really want to continue to do what we've always done because actually that's been successful for us in the past. And perhaps that approach might be successful for some of the time, but it ignores the enormous potential of technological change, for example, to really fundamentally change the way that we work and the kind of work that we do, um, uh, the industries that might emerge. And just before we started um, on this podcast, we were talking, weren't we, about generative AI and how generative AI has changed our world um, over 12 to 14 months. So it is really important that if we want to pay attention um, to how the future might emerge, if we want to pay attention to actually how we play a role in creating that future, we do have to find very different and creative ways to help us make sense of that potential future, don't we? Yeah, I love the way you brought in generative AI because that's that's an untapped tool that's out there right now that anyone without any expertise could use. 
and come up with some ideas. I'm not saying that you use it instead of your own ideas. Mm -hmm. You use it to help yourself think about things more creatively. It's like a coach, you know, it's just there to help you. Yeah. And, um, you know, also there are opportunities to encourage people from all parts of the organization to participate. Maybe they all do their own chat GPT queries and um, from their own perspectives because different professions have different things that they key in on. And then you bring those together. I like to think of um, you know, as a futures tool, uh, using a futures wheel, it's so accessible and it's easy to see first, second, third, and beyond order consequences of things as they collide. Uh, but there, there's all sorts of tools to use. And the idea is just to start thinking about ways of thinking differently. And that's the key, I think, to um, coming up with some of these stories. And I'll be honest with you, you don't have to be a writer to do it, like Bruce Sterling, because the idea, and, and he, I think he says it himself, is that it's not about the prose. It's not about the character development. It's about the scenario. So yeah. you focus on the future of your industry or your sector, whatever. Um, so yeah, but thinking differently, that's the, that's the challenge. And I think uh, generative AI can help, but also bringing lots of different people into the activity could help. Yeah, I love I love that idea of um, uh, of, of broadening engagement, of, of kind of sharing um lots of different perspectives because actually that that difference is really valuable isn't it in in creating new insight um with, with that in mind um, how would you say design fiction differs significantly from other forms of futures work of other forms of foresight yes i when i think of foresight strategic foresight i think of a lot of frameworks and models and process in fact, I think you you have your own processes when you run courses, right? Classes on helping people with futures thinking and you take them through a step-by-step -step process where maybe you're looking at trends and weak signals and then you maybe do some scenario development and you know, it's a process. But with design fiction, I, I want to think of design fiction as, as a part of futures thinking, a few strategic foresight process. So you might go through some of those scenarios, development, the four futures, a futures wheel, uh, any of the exercises that you want to use in foresight. But then you take some of those things and you take the next step and you say, okay, I want people to start taking some of the things that they pulled from these and create these design fictions. And, you know, so, so there, when I talked about, you know, being grounded in research and doing some due diligence. So I would assume that if you were doing future, uh, strategic foresight, you would have done that. Mm -hmm. So when, you, when you've done that, you have a sense of what's out there, what's around there. You've built that world that's there now. Then you take those elements and you either graphically, you could draw a picture, you could craft something out of paper mache or aluminum foil, or however you want to create this future artifact. Some people use photography. It almost doesn't matter what the media is as long as it is easily accessible and follows that discipline of it's something that fits in the world, but has that unsettlingness to it because it it's off for some reason. And at first, maybe you don't even realize it until you really look at it and you start to see there's things that don't exist in the world yet that are in there. And I think that it's just an extension. It's just another tool that you can add to your strategic foresight tool belt. And I, I don't wanna say it's uh, this or that. I wanna say you, you have to include it or you should include it. And it's a way for people to and especially if this is a commercial endeavor, it's a way for people to really product designers and marketers to really like live in that future that they're seeing through these foresight tools. It's a visceral feeling that I can now participate in that future as like I'm reading a magazine that feels a little off, but but it's still recognizable as a magazine and some of the products are recognizable. They just have these crazy new features. Um, and it helps you understand in a way that you probably wouldn't understand just by going through that exercise of strategic foresight and research. 
I really like that idea of an artifact because, you know, a, a, an artifact to a lot of people will be something that we've almost dug up from the past that's been hidden for <laughs> years and years. And then we kind of dig it up and we eventually reveal it and we learn something new. Um, but kind of creating those in the future, I think it works really well. I was involved in a scenario exercise some years ago and, and the artifact we, we ended up creating um, was actually a series of we kind of used the e economist style magazine as the nice. uh, as the base. And we created a series of those and use those throughout the organization as a way to help people engage with with these futures. And it does make a big difference, doesn't it, when there's something physical that you present people with um, and that they engage with to help them think about the future. Yeah, it's almost as if you've created a product in the future and now you're looking at the repercussions of it in the market or something, right? So you've actually taken the leap, invested, created something wildly different, and now you're reading about it as if it has already happened. And that's that's powerful. It sounds like what you've done. And it's kind of uh, in your brain, you know, it's saying like, oh, this is this has happened. So I've already seen it. Now I can probably do it. Uh, yeah, I think it helps us actually move from that wariness to move and like you said before beyond the comfort comfortable to now having the confidence to say well we've already kind of created this in our minds so maybe we should just go ahead and, and create it physically in some way uh, before we get on to kind of actually you use looking at the, a specific example which we said we do do you think there's a degree of courage that individuals within organizations need to be capable of exhibiting to actually adopt these kind of approaches because in many organizations it might feel like an approach that's a little bit out there mightn't it it definitely does and i would say the biggest challenge is when people that dive into futures thinking future uh strategic foresight design fiction those words are not words that the average business person uses, hears, understands, or appreciates. So honestly, my honest opinion is that the same thinking and application could use for, uh, could use renaming for the corporate world. I don't necessarily have a different name, but if you call it some kind of prototyping, that wouldn't be within, that would be within the realm of an organization's expected uh, next step. You just maybe call it a prototyping exercise and but you use this this process. Yeah. And right. I mean, I hate to I hate to yeah, I hate to say it, but that's my take on it. That's my honest opinion, yeah. is that maybe some people just aren't ready for the language that futures thinking possesses. Well, that's okay. Um the the methods are still sound. Yeah. It it's just people maybe aren't ready to to go there. So go with the comfort and then pull in the frameworks the way that, or, or the activities the way we described. And I think once people are engaged in it, um, there's a lot of passion and excitement that happens when creativity is unlocked and people can actually express themselves kind of expansively that um, as long as it doesn't, you know, take a huge portion of their day or their regular activities, I think that um, this is a, a an exercise that has definite you know, a project-based timeline. So it's not something that they're going to do every day, day in and day out. This is kind of an exercise that you might do if you're thinking about new products or new lines of business or a new way of building sustainability in your organization, right? Um, it's just another tool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a really that's a really good reminder to make sure that we do think about these things so we keep people engaged. And, and the last thing you mentioned there about sustainability, I think, is a really nice segue um, into how we were going to kind of discuss the application of, of design thinking, because um, we spoke beforehand, didn't we, about exploring climate change in 2050 as an existential risk um, and exploring that through design thinking. So um, take us take us away with that. What are, what are your thoughts? What are your ideas around that? I, I think the fact that Bruce Sterling wrote the book, Shaping Things, and that was one of his goals. And that was the first mention of design thinking, or design fiction, sorry. It 
So it's kind of interesting that here we are talking about climate change in uh, 2024, and we're not that far away from 2050 or whichever year, 2030, 2050, whichever year you want to believe the Earth's temperature is going to raise uh, at least 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial uh, levels. And so there's been a recent Academy of Sciences study, I think it was just this year, and um, it used artificial intelligence to kind of predict when this might happen, when the Earth might face that 1.5 degree C increase. And according to the model, it doesn't even matter whether we stop uh, emissions, carbon emissions. Like it's it's probably going to happen. There's a very good chance of it happening um, probably by 2050. So regardless of what you believe about how we are going to get there, what are we going to do about it? Because at some point, we're going to deal with whatever caused it, whatever you believe caused it. If it happens, you know, it, it's already, we're already seeing a lot of um, severe weather, unprecedented temperature in both extremes. It's going to get even worse. And so as the ocean levels rise, we're going to have unprecedented flooding. We have mass migrations of people whose, you know, their, their land is underwater and will be for the foreseeable future. So you've got mass migrations, uh, flooding, fires, wildfires that we haven't seen on unprecedented scales, uh, unpredictable, severe weather, uh, massive forest die-offs. And then, you know, you have collapse of ecosystems and food and it's a terrible dystopian world and i you know i don't want to say that i'm predicting it just saying that that's a really scary thought i wouldn't want to if i could do something about it i i would like to try and i would like to think that design fiction no matter what role you play in the world right whether you're a designer an engineer an architect uh, a business person an investor what what could you do to do your part to, to mitigate climate change so that, okay, we might re reach 1.5 degrees C, but let's not go above that. Let's figure out ways to be more sustainable in our own and in our businesses and in our future investments. And I think design fiction can do that for people. I think because it's accessible and it's designed to be commercial, right? So a lot of the examples we see of design fiction show things that people use in commercial applications, magazines, brochures, posters. So it's already accessible as a medium. We just need to, everyone needs to use it as a tool to help their teams understand and appreciate opportunities in the future. Um, you know, imagining different ways of, of power sources. And we, we know about solar and we know about wind and hydroelectric. But I saw this new, just recently, I saw this new article and it was for a material that can harness microvolts of electricity from the air. And I won't go into the science of it. It supposedly works similar to how a thunderhead might work in, uh, in a rainstorm. But the fact is, this is a material that could sh you know, shape the future, but there are thousands of those kinds of technologies out there that could shape a possible different future. Put them into stories or into artifacts that people can really viscerally feel, understand, hold on to, internalize, think about. And then once they've thought about it, like I said, does it become a little bit easier to, uh, to understand that maybe we could make those commercially? And so I'm not trying to say that design fiction is going to save the world, but uh, be, we have to move beyond the iterative change and embrace the real possibility of a different future. We really don't have a choice. I mean, that's that's yeah. how I look at it. That's that's one of the things that fills me full of hope, actually. <laughs> you know, when you think about something like really haven't got that much choice, you know, something needs to happen. But, but one of the things that that struck me as you as, as you were talking there is that um, I I can quite easily imagine um, design fiction about this very dystopian future in the way that that you've described: floods, fire, 
um, mass migration, uh, uh, conflict, you know, resulting from that. But should we also be using design fiction, do you think, to create the mirror image of that to say, you know, this is what we could win if we get these things right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that um, some of those technologies that I mentioned, uh, well, the one, that's just an example of how could you take that technology if you're an engineer or if you're a designer or an architect or a writer and do the research, think about the world with this everywhere, extrapolate that technology into everything. How could that shape a world where everybody uses it instead of X and how much carbon does that save and how does that change shape our world? Um, but more than technology, it's also about our social contracts with the world. Um, how can we think about alternate methods, alternate economies, right? So it isn't extractive of the environment, it's in sustainment with the environment. Um, so there are people that have written those stories. There is um, the Ministry of the Future. It's a book that was written in 2023. It's not exactly a utopian story or a dystopian story. It, it kind of has elements of both because there are models that put forth in that book, economic models that um, that I don't really see people talking about in in the news or in the media or on social media, but they're really imaginative. And you can see how if you think upon your own, think beyond your own lifetime, and economists start to think about the economy beyond their own lifetimes, how you can start to think differently about uh, sustainability. And that book goes there and it doesn't build that world for you, but it builds that idea. And I think that's the next step is to take an idea like that and start building that story around how, how a world could be shaped differently if we adopted that model and fill in the, fill in the blanks a little bit. Absolutely. And then tell a great story of how we could, well, we have to face climate change regardless, yes. but it doesn't have to end in uh, a dystopian ending, right? We we have some hope. So the, so the other thing that strikes me was um, th this idea that, you, you know, you might be an economist describing an economic model um, uh, that exists once I finished being an economist. So does thinking that far into the future, do you think, free us up from the constraints that we might have in our thinking that's so grounded in where we are today. So, you know, thinking that far into the future, it frees us up from the stuff that holds us back today. Is that an advantage, do you think, in, in, in design fiction as well? I mean, I mean, I think design fiction is rooted in a near future. Hmm. But I do think that thinking longer term futures and then bringing it back to where you are now. And you still use design fiction that way. So if you think about the world you want in 2050, you might create a, well, we might call it backcasting in uh, foresight. But if you would actually think about well, what does that look like in just three years or five years ahead, and then build that into your design fiction as, as a roadmap toward that longer term future. And I mean, honestly, there's a Harvard Business Review article, I'm not sure, it's a couple of years old at least, but they talk about design fiction in uh, in, in industry. And they talk about a company that uh, it was car, car insurance or something, but they actually changed as a, as a result of a design fiction application in, in, you know, they brought people in and interviewed people and ran them through kind of what we would call a foresight process, but then they ended up with a artifact and it actually ended up shaping or reshaping their uh, innovation roadmap. So they did find value in that. And, you know, I don't think they did the next generation kind of thing and backcasting it, but I still think that you could pick whatever timeline you wanted, but for design fiction i think you want to bring it into the near future okay no that's that's clear and 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 again i think the thing that you said there that I, i'm always talking to people about as well is making sure that 
you know, whether it's design fiction, whether it's scenarios, the result of horizon scanning, you need to make sure that you connect people with your findings to where they are today. Um, because actually, that you know, that's why they use it, because they can see validity in it today, um, even though it might be um, situated in the future. Perfect. Uh, You're absolutely right. Gina, that's been nearly 30 minutes of us chatting around design fiction, um, what it is, um, where and how we might use it. Um, uh, and that's been absolutely fascinating. I've really thoroughly enjoyed that, as I do every time um, uh, we, we get together on the podcast. So thank you so much for your time again. Thank you so much, Steve. Thoroughly enjoyed the conversation, as always. And thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. Um, do let your friends and colleagues know about the podcast and there'll be another episode along very soon.